Welcome to another off-season edition of Fantasy Football Today, DFS. I am Sia Najad at Sia Najad, continuing our off-season series, highlighting DFS game theory, strategy, and some player analysis. Today, we are doing something a little bit different. We're diving into best ball with Chris Spaggs at Chris Spaggs. That's C-H-R-I-S-S-P-A-G-S. Chris, how are you today? I'm great to see you. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to do the show. I know this is a largely a DFS show, but that's my background, trying to segue into the best ball world as best I can with some of the strategy I know you're talking about all offseason long. So uh, it's an exciting time to be a part of it, and I'm glad you guys are having me on to talk about it, and hopefully we could sell some people on, on playing some best ball this summer. See, I'm so glad you said that because I think I'm part of your audience to sell it, to be honest with you. You know, Chris, you know, we talked about it before we went live. You know, I'm part of the sort of that DFS space. I'm an analyst in the DFS space. Of course, I've done redraft my, you know, my, what feels like my whole life. And I think there's a lot of people like myself, and I know a little bit about best ball, but, but I haven't played it in all candor. I think there's a lot of people like myself that are like, well, why do I want to do best ball? Like I've got DFS, I've, I've got my redraft leagues, I've got maybe a dynasty league here and there. Um, but do I need this sort of wrinkle in my sort of fantasy football life? And, and I'm starting to realize when I look at, for example, DraftKings, when I go into the lobby for their best ball lobby, which frankly, I wasn't even sure they had six months ago, there's already like 135,000 people registered for this 800,000 person tournament. So clearly, you know, this is a popular thing. It's not just the sharks. It's not just the people, Chris, that are in your space. So I, I just want to ask you, you know, A, how did you get into best ball and sort of what turned you on to it? What makes you like want to play best ball maybe over some of the other things? So a lot of the credit I'll give to my podcast partner, Pete Overzet, who I do the show Splash Play with. Um, you know, it's been a lot of fun learning from him, a guy who was honestly, I would say, really early to the space. Um, started streaming it pretty heavily, just doing live best ball drafts, I think, during the beginning of COVID, if I'm remembering correctly, um, with some of his podcast partners who do the Ship Chasing podcast. And for me, it was, you know, it uh, scratches a lot of those itches that you see with DFS where, you know, like I know the optimizers are the way to win for DFS. Ultimately, though, like I have the most fun hand building lineups. And that's what best ball is. So you're you're building DFS lineups in April, May, June, July, August. You're building on different information flows that are coming out during those time periods. And you're building it for gigantic prize pools. Your underdog has $10 million in total prizes in their big tournament, the Best Ball Mania 3. They have puppy tournaments that are $5 entry fees for a 150 max tournament. That's also, I think, 75K prize pools, upwards of like 100K, 150K. So you're con kind of combining the best of these redraft leagues, uh, redraft leagues, these dynasty leagues, along with what I think is the most fun part of fantasy football is that hand building component and then with the dfs prize structure so um you know the hope is of big paydays but obviously a lot of that comes down to the strategy you bring to every single draft you're trying to do yeah and, and i'm glad you mentioned the splash play pod that you do with peter overs at a super great show again that's at splash play pod you can find that on twitter and of course you can find chris bags at the football outsiders which is a great great site for a variety of different reasons so i encourage everybody to check that out so let's start with the basics let's assume I'm somebody that just heard about best ball because I just listened to this podcast and, and I, I want to know where to find it. What platform do I should I just jump run to DraftKings? Are there other places maybe as a beginner that you'd recommend or all the platforms kind of the same? So there is going to be some best ball tournaments on DraftKings. There's a million dollar tournament up there, a Millie maker for best ball. That's $5 entry fees, 150 uh, entry max on there. Underdog is the one that I would say I prefer the most. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of fun playing on there. I'm you know, lucky to get some promo coding through them as well. So that's, but this is not even an ad thing. Like I got the ads because I really loved the platform. I was able to kind of, you know, build that network through Pete as well, but it's so much fun playing on underdog. Like I would really recommend that one in terms of the user interface. You get really nice notification systems going. Going. You'd also see the different structures people are building with. FFPC is also a big one. Drafters are big ones. You know, like there's a lot of places you can spend your money on if you choose to go that route. But ultimately, you know, you want to find the place you're most comfortable with. There's different rules, wrinkles for all of them where DraftKings, uh, best ball is going to be the same structure, same scoring as DFS, their normal NFL DFS weekly tournaments, whereas underdog is half point PPR. So there's some different structures there. FanDuel's best ball is going to be the same scoring as their DFS. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it based on your proclivities. And, you know, ultimately, I think you're going to have fun no matter what you're doing with it as long as you are going after it so let's talk about you know when, when i think of best ball i think of and correct me if i'm wrong here that it, it's more like a, a set it and forget it type thing that like some of the advantages are you know tuesday nights or whenever your waiver's clear like you don't have to be you know messing with that and even maybe an advantage over dfs maybe you for whatever reason you think this year you don't have time for dfs i guess and and you just want to have this best ball league to carry you through um sort of describe what what i mean by set it and forget it like what are you doing on the front end and and are you literally just sort 
sort of watching it play out the rest of the NFL season. Yeah, so basically you're sitting down. It depends on if you're doing a slow draft or a fast draft. A slow draft would be there's 12-hour windows for each person to make a pick, and then you get a notification when it's your time on the clock, and then you have to make your pick within that 12-hour window. But fast drafts are the one that I enjoy doing, and 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 see what you're saying about that. It, it speaks a lot to me because I love NBA DFS. It's you know the sport I've had the most success with. It's part of how I was able to get this house with some NBA DFS winnings at the end of the playoffs last year. But ultimately, it's a lot of time-consuming effort. It's a lot of time that comes off the books. You know, For NBA, as if you played it all this year the injuries were out of control as much as they were during the covid periods and you're talking about being on the clock for about eight hours of paying attention for late swaps and all that whereas best ball it's 45 minutes an hour you're sitting down doing an 18 round draft on an underdog a 20 round draft on DraftKings, but you're still just there for that finite period of time and then what you do there is it takes the highest score for you each week based on that construction so you're going to have your one qb your two running backs your three wide receivers your one tight end your one flex position and it's going to just pick the best guy from everybody you drafted to give you the optimal lineup of all the the guys you have on your roster so there is a lot of set it forget it and, and for me as somebody i don't know if you know some people out there might relate like my high school league died unfortunately with my friends because like we just couldn't keep doing people when they had families when they had other obligations couldn't remember to set their teams or couldn't remember to do mm. waivers or were just you know getting worked because they weren't doing that process and best ball it's not part of it so i personally hope it gets adopted more and i hope that you know, people just get see the fun in it where you know you can do it you can be done with it or you could just keep plowing and put in 150 entries and the drafts don't have to stop so, Chris, I have to ask you, because you brought up NBA DFS and how successful you were specifically last year. I'm just curious, because I know like when I hit big in, let's say, like an NFL DFS contest, like a couple of years ago, I, I hit pretty big because Kyler Murray threw that long bomb to DeAndre Hopkins against the Bills. And I got super lucky, obviously, in, in some regard. But I'm curious was there an NBA player that like carried you to like a big ticket win that you, you just you, you, like to this day, you're like, Oh man, I, I love that guy so much because he, he did this for my lineup. Well, for me, honestly, this guy, now the bloom has come off the rose a little bit over the last week, but Jason Tatum was the guy I had at 3% owned in that series against the Brooklyn Nets uh, last playoffs. And he ended up going off there. And, you know, that's sort of the same philosophy that you can bring from in the DFS style to a best ball tournament where, you know, in some of the structures you build at certain spots you're drafting, like let's say you're drafting at the 101. If you take Cooper Cup at the first spot instead of Jonathan Taylor, you're probably going to be different from a good portion of people who are drafting that same spot. And I think that's where the DFS principles do come to mind, where it's still about building contrarian lines. It's still about but the contrarian lineups that fall within a range of outcomes that's actually likely to happen but ultimately that's what i think is the fun part of it is that uh jason tatum you know can be a hero for me but in best ball like i have no clue it's going to be this year and i just hope somebody actually bails me out from i'm sure the many mistakes i'm making along the way so it does it come down to and i know roster construction we'll get into that in, in a second but does it come down to really drafting for upside i, I understand that's a super generic uh, way to describe it. And maybe you would you would classify your redraft and your DFS strategy the same way. But does it come down to guys that like you just want a roster full of upside guys because you are only filling those those quote starter spots. And if each week you get just a ton of upside and then maybe some downside, well, the downside weeks, they're not going to be part of that like starting lineup because they're not going to slot in there. Is that sort of the way to look at it for the beginner? I think there is a certain bit of a, a building a Jenga tower component to it where you are trying to pull from certain parts and you want to give yourself, you know, a foundation, but you do want to give yourself that volatility where, you know, if you're building an optimizer lineup for uh, DFS and during the NFL season, you want to have normally a wide receiver in the flex because wide receiver is going to have that ceiling that give you a shot to win a hundred thousand person tournament or a 500,000 person tournament. That's what best ball is, except that there are some wrinkles that make it a bit different that we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about more, but week 17 correlations are a very big part of things where week 17, that's where where all the money is going to be. That's where you could win your $2 million. You could win your $1 million if you finish second. So you are trying to build for a team that's going to be strong enough to get through those early rounds, but also still give you that upside when it becomes basically a 500 person DFS tournament. So yeah, the volatility is a big part of it, but it comes with some you know caveats though, that if you have too much risk profile, like you don't have the floor you need, and that's where your, your JD McKissick's of the world, your, your Keenan Allen's of the world, the guys that you know you can rely on week in, week out. That's an important part of the construction as well. Okay, so let's get the week 17 part out of the way. I want you to talk about it like I, I know nothing about best ball. Why is week 17 so important? Why do you need to think forward to week 17 when you're doing your best ball draft three, four months before? Hey, this is a week I need to be focused on to some degree. 
So that, that's one big difference. I think that ties into what we were talking about with redraft as well is that, you know, you're building a team. If you're trying to advance into the playoff rounds, which, you know, end at week 14 is when all the teams will then qualify for the next few rounds of playoffs. You're building a team that might be more running back heavy. And, and you know, if you're playing a 12 person league with your friends from high school, like, yeah, take Christian McCaffrey, take Jonathan Taylor. But if you're trying to build for week 17, that means pairing games like Bengals Buffalo. Like that's a game that should, you know, on paper project to be a, a 51 point over under, let's say by the time week 17 rolls around, I'm completely making that number up, but something over 50 that you would normally want in a DFS tournament. That's what you're expecting there. So for week 17, you're just trying to target really any game you want because we don't know how these offenses are going to look. Like maybe Cleveland will be world beaters. Maybe Washington will be world beaters and that game will be more appealing than it seems right now. But ultimately, if you have those correlations of you know Cleveland, Washington, Indianapolis, New York, um, the Jets versus Seattle as a low on one that I like, the point is that you're trying to spike that upside for week 17. So when it becomes this one 500 person DFS tournament, you're in the, be the best position to kind of make the most money out of what you're doing there and that's where the expected value comes in where if you get it to week 15 if you advance and just make the playoffs that's 35 dollars to you if you win week 17 that's two million dollars to you so that's where you know the expected value is if you know if you're sharp better you might get that a little bit more but ultimately you're going to win more money by caring about week 17 than you will just trying to make the playoffs so regular season wise is it 12 weeks and then you advance to week 13 where you play a different crop of players is that how it generally works it's the first 14 weeks, and then there's week 15 is one pair down, week 16 is one pair down, and then week 17 is the grand prize week. Right. So Okay, so getting to, to that second round, like so you're obviously building to get to that second round, but you also have in mind, okay, I, I want to be able to get to week 17 with this roster, but I also want to have in mind some correlations and, and some stacks and some maybe contrarian games that people won't be pinpointing so that when I get to week 17, I can smash. Is that sort of the, the concept there? Yep, I think you nailed it completely. You know, it's all about building for a team that's sustainable enough to get you where they need to go. And you could even sacrifice a little bit on projections if you are getting those week 17 correlations. But the goal, you know, from how I see it is that you're trying to get through with really the narrowest margins possible for week 14, you know, to get into the playoffs then to advance in the week 15 round, the week 16 round. And then week 17, you want it to all really hit that crescendo where last year, Jamar Chase went for 50 points in that round. Like that ended up being the deciding factor for the teams that won that money. That's a big part of what you're trying to do is find who's going to be this year's Jamar Chase. And you might not know the exact game, but if you do, you know, draft structurally where you're trying to really prioritize wide receivers, trying to prioritize tight end tight ends in certain spots, like that's the kind of thing that you can do for yourself where it's all about building to that week 17, you know, season finale in a lot of ways. So let's talk about actually drafting and building a lineup. So, so obviously you play one, so you have, a, it's an 18 person roster, right, Chris? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, so obviously you have one quarterback that's going to, quote, start for you each week. It sounds like you have two running backs, you have a flex, three receivers, and a tight end. So with that in mind, you know, you want to have at least two quarterbacks, obviously, but do you want to have three? It can vary. And I think that's where, you know, the draft capital that you're taking guys at is going to inform things where if you take Patrick Mahomes in those first four rounds, you're probably not going to take another QB until a little bit later in the draft. Um, there are some ideal QB zones that you know, a lot of the research out there says to follow where, um, you know, based on teams that have had the most success historically, that means drafting your first QB rounds six through nine, and then drafting your second QB rounds eight through 13, but really just trying to get those two QBs in that round six through 13 zone. That gives you guys who have the ability to you know boost up the entire stack. Like where if a Dak Prescott is good, he's probably going to make CeeDee Lamb better. He's probably going to make Jalen Tolbert better. He's probably going to make Dalton Schultz better. And that's where you can kind of rise that tide upwardly. And that's a big part of it as well is that you are trying to stack, but you're also really trying to get these guys into positions that um, are going to really add the entire lineup to correlate and make more sense. So let's say you have that Dak stack with Jalen Tolbert and CD Lamb, then you bring it back with uh, Hassan Haskins, who you could benefit, let's say, if Derrick Henry completely breaks down for Tennessee. Hassan Haskins, another big back in that Tennessee backfield who can come in and be that, you know, bring back option for Tennessee for week 17. You then have built a team that's probably pretty different, but also a team that gives you a lot of upside when you need it the most for that, that big week 17 payday and so usually when people step into a draft whether it's really the drafting for weekly dfs or redraft so the, the big thing they want to load up on is hey let, let me make sure i get my running back secure now that's changing quite a bit because of how the receiver position has been over the last few years in particular but do you have a certain strategy when it comes to and i understand it depends on where you pick but do you want to have like two running backs early or do you go one running back early and just load up on on maybe some high upside receivers and then take a couple running backs later is there a general strategy you go into for that or does it depend on where you're drafting 
So it does depend on the room a lot too, where there are sometimes where we'll do a draft on the stream on Splash Play. And because this audience that, you know, that we have self-selecting who's watching this show, like they're probably people who played best ball for a few years and they know the value of wide receivers up top. So you then will see those rooms with wide receivers, wide receivers just flying off the boards early on. And that could be something then where you decide, hey, I need to grab Cooper Cup now because if I don't get him, I might just be out of luck at wide receiver overall. But then you could also go the other way, and then you could play the leverage against that and take all the running backs people are leaving behind. You know, Ideally, the first three rounds only, you would call that a hyper-fragile build where you are focusing on the top echelon running backs and hoping that they pay off and they don't have the you know the guys through the backup who would come in then and take the workload. But it's really different constructions based upon the rooms, and I think that's the biggest thing that you can do is um, for, for best ball in particular, like really focusing on the average drafted position is the smartest thing you do for yourself because the market data that's informing where people are drafting guys is the most powerful thing you have for yourself. And if you start to outthink that too much, there's a lot of studies that Underdog has done where if you take a guy 12 picks ahead of where the rest of the field's taking a guy, he's probably going to be much worse for you just because of the fact you're competing against people getting him at a much lower spot. And there's just levels and levels of game theory here that I think really lend credence to why a chess player won Best Ball Mania last year because there is mm -hmm. these levels and levels of thought. The 4D chess of it all is very paramount, I think, in Best Ball. That is really interesting that a chess player actually won. That is um, kind of speaks to the game theory behind it, Chris. Mm -hmm. So so the ADP part is interesting. And for the record, for those of you that are listening, I think some of you probably know how to play best ball. And you're like, OK, well, when are we going to get to some of the stacks or players that, that Chris is interested in? We actually are going to get to that in a couple of minutes. But I did want to ask you about ADP because. While I, I I understand the ADP argument that you, that the best approach might be to stick to the ADP and you can print out rankings, I assume. Um, I don't know. Does football outsiders have? They don't have uh, best ball rankings. We, we have some rankings, but it's not made for a best ball. But there, there are ones that are built into most of the platforms anyway that'll be there for you. But I don't want me to cut off your points yet. But please go. No, ahead. no. I was just asking because I know you can get like free ones. Like some sites have free yeah, stuff. Yeah, you can but... make your own too if you wanted, but they do yeah. have them on the site. And I think generally to me, like, you know, you can upload your own CSV of all the rankings. I'd rather see what the actual people are using on Underdog, just or, you know, on DraftKings as well or FanDuel. Um, because that's going to be the most native to you. Like a guy like KJ Handler will go in the 20th round on DraftKings. An underdog, sometimes he goes in the 12th, 13th round. So there's mm -hmm. some variability there that can be hard just to keep in top of your head that um, the sites can give you as just a, a data point to start things off with. Sneaky KJ Hamler play. So the, the point I was trying to make, uh, and perhaps I'll make this inartfully, but when you talk about ADP and hey, the best strategy, just if you're, if you're a beginner in particular, stick to ADP. At some point in this, what I believe to be an 18 round draft, you need to sort of break off from that, right? Because again, you're thinking of with week 17 in mind and correlating maybe some some sort of contrarian games that you think might have upside that no, nobody else is going to smash. Like, so at some point, don't you have to go off script a little bit to, to grab some of those some of those guys that people aren't really interested in in week one, but might be interested in, in week 17? To some extent, yeah, but you're still trying to mostly operate within a spectrum of keeping it. I, you know, for me, it's like within 10 picks where I like Jalen Tolbert mm -hmm. a lot. I think he's got a really high upside in this Cowboys offense. I'm not as big of a believer in Michael Gallup immediately getting on the field right away as some people right. seem to be. Um, but that's a spot where you could take Tolbert and, you know, he's probably going in the 150s. If you took him in the 140s, it wouldn't be crazy because the market is not as established of where that is as compared to a Cooper Cup, as compared to a Jonathan Taylor or Jamar Chase, the guys that are going at the top of the draft. So that's something to keep in mind as well. I do think a lot of the stands you can make, though, are where Room decides, hey, this guy isn't good for whatever reason. Like James Robinson, obviously coming off a serious injury, but expected to be a part of that Jacksonville backfield. He sometimes goes in the 200s and his ADP is normally 160. At that point, it's kind of just found money because if there's other people are saying, hey, I don't want to draft this guy. Uh, you know, even if you don't believe in him, he's now more valuable to you just because of the fact that you're getting him at a cheaper spot than everybody else is getting him at. So that's the kind of balances people have to make. But um, that kind of ties to the importance of structural drafting where, you know, a zero RB format where you don't take a running back for the first few rounds, first five rounds or so, um, a hyper fragile build, like those are the things that kind of inform that process the most. But ultimately, like the structure is going to be what guides you. And then you hopefully use ADP as a lever along with this overall structure that you're trying to adhere to. Okay, so we're actually going to get into some of the the players and, and picks and perhaps some of the stacks that Chris likes. But before we do that, we are going to take a moment to hear something from our partners. And we are back with Chris Spaggs at Chris Spaggs. Again, you can find him at Splash Play Pod and on Football Outsiders. Chris, so we've talked a, a lot about the theory. And now let's get into some, uh, some of the players. And I, frankly... I, I'm not 100% sure how to lead here since I, again, I fully concede I've never done a best ball draft, but I, 
do I do I approach this by asking you, hey, what are some early round targets that you're interested in? Where do you where where's your optimal place to pick from? Where, where would you like to lead that conversation? I mean, we could talk a little bit about some of what I would expect to be the chalkier stacks that I think have sort of an obvious value. And the Bengals are one that'll jump out right away. Yeah. Jamar Chase goes in that first five picks on pretty much every site. Then you'll see T. Higgins go. Um, in part because people love that Bengal stack so much. T. Higgins' ADP has now come up uh, quite a bit. He was in the mid-30s. Now he sometimes goes in the high teens. Sometimes, um, I think generally around 20 is where he's going for the most part. But that's going to be a popular stack because people see that you know Cincinnati-Buffalo game. People then want to get parts of both sides of that for Week 17, and they know that that, hey, these are two teams that should be good, two teams that are have some of the best futures markets going their way right now in the NFL betting streets. So that's something to keep in mind as well. But ultimately, you know, like the Bengals will be a very chalky stack. So then how do you get different? Maybe you don't take Jamar Chase. And what you're doing then is making a bet if you were to take, let's say, Joe Burrow with T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd. You're then saying with that lineup that you're building for yourself, you're making a bet against Jamar Chase because you're saying, hey, Jamar Chase was not worth that five spot. He's going to be worse than that. You know, maybe he gets hurt. Obviously, you're never rooting for that, but that is one way that you benefit from best ball. And what you're trying to do then is find different constructions where you can get the same stack everybody else is going to have, or the same team rather, but different configurations of that stack. So that's so, something that I think has value to me is trying to get the lower own version of things for uh, for the Bills. It would be like instead of taking Diggs, um, Diggs and, and Gabe Davis, you would then take, let's say, Gabe Davis and Dawson Knox or or Jameson Crowder and Gabe Davis. Like that's how you should approach things if you want to get different from the field. But ultimately, you know, a lot of the field isn't stacking enough anyway. So if you take that Bengal stack, you're probably with, let's say, 10% of the field. And this is me talking off the top of my head. There's not a hard number to expect there. But ultimately, you know, if you want to get really different from that 10%, you can kind of cut it even thinner. And, and that's where there's some value. And there's also low owned stacks you can go to, like Seattle. Like if you believe in Drew Locke, that could have some value to, uh, it's one that I've extolled the virtues a lot of, where I, I believe in Drew Locke as a player, a deep ball thrower, a guy can run a little bit. And nobody wants to take him with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. So that week 17 game with the Jets and Seahawks ends up going up in a big way. And Drew Lock ends up being a guy that you need, or if just DK Metcalf or Tyler Lockett are guys that you need, that's a stack that could be really low owned. And that's the way I would encourage people to think about is just get the stack and then kind of let the room tell you which stack you're going to take. So speaking of stack, so, you know, obviously you're drafting at least two quarterbacks, I would assume. Are you correlating the second quarterback as well? In other words, are you trying to draft, let's say you want to do the chalky one with like Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and Burrow, and then you come back and you try to do Drew Locke with, with one or two pass catchers, one or one or two of Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. Is that something that you'd look at from the second quarterback from a correlation standpoint? I don't think you have to. There are some lineups that I really like a lot that I have, which are Niners Raiders week 17 correlations where I have Trey Lance, I have Derek Carr, and then have some configuration of Debo Samuel and George Kittle for the Niners side with Trey Lance, and then some configuration of Devontae Adams, Hunter Renfro, Darren Waller for the Raiders side. And that's one where there can be some value to that, where if this game, if this Niners Raiders game in week 17 is so much higher scoring than everything else, maybe then I have the luxury then of Derek Carr has a 30 fantasy point day, Trey Lance is a 35 fantasy point day, and now I can have the best ball lineup select for me, which guy was the one who was more worthwhile. And that's something that can be useful, but you know, I wouldn't try to go out of your way to target it just because, you know, there is the push pull dynamics that we know from DFS where normally, you know, both QBs aren't going to have the same upside. Both uh, yeah. stacks of wide receivers aren't going to have the same upside and you probably have more utility going to an opposing team's running back. So taking a Josh Jacobs with that Trey Lance stack might be more logical, but I think, you know, there's merits to both sides just because you're giving your shot at that correlation that people aren't targeting nearly enough in best ball. So you mentioned, I love the DFS crossover here because you let's stick with the Bengals just by way of example. So you talked about maybe sort of a, I, I don't know you that you'd call it contrarian, but when you're fading Jamar Chase, you're, you're trying to go against the field, obviously, mm -hmm. by correlating Burrow with, let's say, T. Higgins or Tyler Boyd. You know, in DFS, the contrarian play for me would be that, but it would also to be fade the passing game altogether and, and, and put in Joe Mixon into your lineup because everybody thinks it's going to be a, a passing fest. And lo and behold, Mixon has 125 yards and three touchdowns. So it, does that type of contrarian move actually work out? Is that something to target in, in best ball as well? I think so. I mean, ultimately, you're trying to target games that'll be high scoring week 17. And as we know from playing DFS time and time again, ultimately, you're just trying to figure out how can this team put this amount of points up. And yeah, it's a decent possibility that it will be Joe Burrow throwing three touchdowns, two of which go to Jamar Chase, one of which goes to T. Higgins. But there's a very realistic possibility that maybe, you know, there's one big play for uh, for T. Higgins early on, and then Joe Mixon just salts the game away because the Bills can't get anything going. So it really is about playing that narrative, playing that game script. And no matter what the configuration is, just remembering that, hey, this 
is a game that could have a lot of points and it could come in a variety of ways. So even taking a running back with a wide receiver, normally in DFS, you're not trying to do that. But for best ball, you're just making a bet on the team being good. So if the Bengals are good, they're going to score a lot of points. They're going to be in a lot of competitive games. There's a lot of outs for Joe Mixon and Jamar Chase to get there. The question is, do they get there at the same time? Probably not. But the net results of your lineup being tethered to the team that's really good and having a different configuration will probably add value to you over the course of the season. So it's interesting because you obviously want to target offenses that are high scoring, just like you would in, in by the way, in redraft or DFS. That's none, none of that is, is groundbreaking, but you talked about some popular stacks. Certainly the Bills and the Bengals would be at the top of the list. You know, I think of the AFC West in general, and, and I'm like, all right, well, I, I literally could pick any team there and be totally okay with, with how that might play out from a best ball standpoint. I'm curious, are all four of those stacks or teams popular in best ball is, is one way more popular than the others in that division in particular. I think in the AFC West, you're probably going to see a lot of the charger stacks because it is pretty easy to get to uh, Justin Herbert combined with one of Keenan Allen and one of Mike Williams. And then you can get your Josh Palmer late and get your Gerald Everett late. I think those ones that set up really easily, according to ADP are going to be the most popular, but I'm with you. See, like, I think that's a really strong approach. Like the AFC West to me, I don't know how every game in that division doesn't have over a 50 point over under yeah. just because of the teams that are in play there, really high octane offenses. And I think that is one thing you can have, you know, some merit to. And, and that's, you could extend it even further where, you know, on paper, yeah, the AFC West looks great. What if the NFC East is a shootout division? Like we just don't know mm -hmm. how these things go. Defense is one of the least sticky things year to year as our, our football outsiders research has shown for the real life football applications. So that's something where, you know, if you just love the AFC North, maybe it will be less of a defense heavy division, obviously hard to say that given what we've seen historically but that's where you can make these bets for yourself and start to think about the next level correlations of it all and you know you don't have to go out of your way to make sure that you have the neatest you know two broncos two raiders two chiefs two chargers like you don't have to do it that way but ultimately if you do get a little little bits of taste of these guys here and there and just kind of let your process inform that i love afc west guys i love nfc east guys like there is some value into that process overall and i think the afc west would be the first division i would look at if you're going to try to do that approach yeah. And, you know, the NFC East is such a good example of how things can fluctuate. The Washington football team commanders that we call them now, you know, that was a top five defense two seasons ago. And last season was a bottom five defense. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like things can, especially on the defensive side of the ball, things can happen pretty quickly. I'm a Washington commanders fan, so I'm intimately I'm uh, sorry, familiar. Sorry. <laughs> I know <laughs> it's been a, uh, it's been a few decades. <laughs> so um, not great. So, okay. We talked about some chalk stacks, which you're, you're probably going to be tending to to avoid, Chris, I assume. How about some stacks that, whether you call them contrarian or not, you know, feel free to to, to explain that part. But what are some stacks or some teams that you're actually you know, kind of attacking in your best ball drafts? I would say for me that Niners Raiders stacks so both sides of that because of the week 17 correlation to the fact that you can get Trey Lance at pretty cheap and know that he has a pretty good upside. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, it seems unlikely at this point to come back. I think uh, we can say that pretty safely based on the media reports and everything that's happened with him so far in their OTAs and mini camps. Trey Lance to me, a rushing QB who has some really obvious targets to go to some fun weapons. So you could take in the 18th round, like a guy like Danny Gray, who runs a four, three can be a sneaky way to get to that stack. And maybe, and maybe you make a bet against Debo Samuel where he's been, a, a guy who was rumored to be holding out. He's shown up to camp so far, but things can get weird with him. Like th that happens time to time. Maybe you go with a Danny Gray or a Brandon Ayuk stack. Like that's some ways you can get different there. But I love the Niners. I think Trey Lance is really, I think he's actually my highest exposed QB right now. Um, I am a Drew Locke stand, as I talked about earlier. I think that's one where your mileage may vary on that one. I wouldn't go as heavy on Drew Locke if you're you, but if you're me and willing to make that bet, <laughs> I do like Drew Locke enough to go there. The Jets, I think Zach Wilson are one that was getting steamed up pretty heavily as well, you know, because there is a really clean stack to get through there with Garrett Wilson and also Elijah Moore, hopefully making the jump in his second year. Um, so th those are some teams just to go off of there. But ultimately, as long as you're taking a QB with two pass catchers, I think you're doing the best you can. And, you know, there's some variability there as well. Like, like, see, if for your Washington commanders, like maybe take Carson Wentz to JD McKissick, you can do that correlation there because McKissick's not running the ball enough to, you know, take away from Carson Wentz. But ultimately I care the most about, you know, QB plus two pass catchers, whether that be a running back pass catcher, but ideally a wide receiver tight end pass catcher. Is there a situation where you would potentially, and I don't know if waste is the right word, but but waste an additional pick on a third pass catcher and just let the chips fall where they may. Like, let's say in the commander situation, you take Carson Wentz, McLaurin, Curtis Samuel, and not Deami Brown, but but let's say uh, the, the rookie from Penn State. who Dotson, I'm Dotson. yeah. yeah. Um, is, is that, a, I'm not saying that particular team, but but do you, when you draft, are you drafting three pass catchers instead of two sometimes, or is that just too much capital to invest? 
if they fall to you, like especially I think at the Bengals are one where if you get Jamar Chase, you get T. Higgins, and you also get Tyler Boyd or Hayden Hurst, like I don't have an issue with that. Uh, I think there are probably some data points out there that would prove that the the margins of return are probably shrinking a little bit there. But if it's a team that's good, you know, the Chiefs right now, there's some uncertainty there. You know, I think that's one where you could target an MVS, you could target a Sky Moore, you could target a McCole Hardman, and it wouldn't be crazy to do that if you're leveraging against Travis Kelsey. But ultimately, what every yeah, you know, every team you build, you're trying to do is what you're trying to say with each one is that I'm making bets that I'm right with every player yeah. I draft here. I made the correct choice. So when you take a two man stack, it's just more powerful because you're basically saying that Patrick Mahomes is only going to throw to Marquez Valdez Scantling, or not, you know, not only, but primarily throw to MVS, primarily throw to Travis Kelsey. That's going to be the cleaner way to do that because you are expecting Kelsey and MVS to have these seasons that bubble up enough to justify where you're drafting them. So I think the two man stack is most powerful, but onslaught stacks for good teams is not something I would definitely. That's what I go against at all. Yeah. So it sounds to me like, you, you know, if you're playing best ball, you, you're not trying to play the, let me ensure this game. You're, you're just trying to like get the optimal production out of the guys that you are actually counting on and not the, the insurance plays. You can yeah, get exactly. And don't take the backup things. running back. Like if you take Aaron Jones, don't take AJ Dillon, because by taking Aaron Jones, the second round, you're saying that Aaron Jones is going to be a monster this year. He's going to get all the pass game work in the red zone that Devontae Adams leaves behind. Like that's what you're saying with when you take Aaron Jones with where he's going right now. Whereas if you take AJ Dillon, you're saying, Hey, something went wrong with Aaron Jones. Maybe he got hurt. Maybe he uh, ran bad. Maybe he fell out with the Packers in the preseason. Maybe he, Aaron Rodgers didn't like the, his stances on certain shots or things. I don't know whatever the case may be but the point is you're making a bet with each pick you take so it's important to inform that and again drafting like you're right like you knew something that everybody else didn't with each pick you take yeah okay so i want to get to some late round sleepers or maybe some breakout candidates whether they be rookies or or veterans but i want to ask you maybe maybe about let, let's go with maybe one more stack that you're interested in so we talked about a couple chalky ones which makes sense um maybe the afc west in general it, but the Chargers specifically, we talked about the Bills, we talked about the Bengals, and then we talked about the Niners in terms of some that are a little like a little off the map. We talked about the Raiders. Man, I, I like the Raiders. Given how bad that defense is likely to be, how many points they're likely to give up, especially against their AFC West opponents, I don't think their schedule is particularly easy against offenses either. And then you take, hey, we added Devontae Adams. Jaron Waller's likely to, I mean, I shouldn't say likely to be healthy, but should be more healthy this season than he was last season. Um, I think Hunter Renfro, he doesn't get the credit he deserves. He's a great receiver as well there's a lot of weapons on this team and so i just it seems to me like that is a place to target whether it's in best ball or dfs i know Derek carr isn't the running quarterback that we want like josh allen or jalen hurts or lamar jackson but i think Derek carr might have to do, might have to do so much through the air um playing comeback ball or just keeping pace that he might offset some of the the lack of uh rushing production with that with all that said sorry for the speech no, I mean, um, I agree completely. So you could soapbox yeah. on that all you want. <laughs> Fair. Okay, good. I mean, for the record, I don't think Derek Carr gets the credit he deserves either yeah. as an actual, you know, quarterback. Let's like, like leave fantasy out of it for a second. But with all that said, are there any other teams that you're focused on that maybe other teams just frankly aren't paying much attention to? I know you mentioned Seattle as well and maybe the New York Jets. Anybody else? I would say Atlanta is one that to me is pretty interesting because you do have two big bodied receivers there in an ambiguous QB situation where, you know, for me, Marcus Mariota, you can get him for literally nothing in a draft as well. And then the hope is that this is his last shot to be a starting QB. I would think with a former offensive coordinator of his and Arthur Smith, who's now the head coach in Atlanta, I think he's got a shot there. And then you have two really obvious high volume targets, potentially in Drake London and Kyle Pitts. So that has some appeal to me, but I do think the Raiders when he spelled out is probably one of my favorites as well, just because it's a different ways to chop it up. Um, I would say to give you one different one that could be contrarian and could make sense given the head coaching change and the fact that as a young QB who comes in with an elite pedigree, people are probably sleeping on a little too much. Jacksonville stack could be pretty appealing as well with Christian Kirk signing that big deal, a team that should be better with Doug Peterson calling the plays and hopefully getting creative after taking a year you know, out of the NFL, hopefully honing his craft and getting better with it. Trevor Lawrence, the jump you know, for really any position player, but QBs year one to year two is going to be pretty valuable for him, you would hope. So you can take Christian Kirk and, you know, let's say the eighth round, the ninth round, you can get then whatever other Jag you want. Zay Jones, their free agent signing could be valuable late. Marvin Jones, if he hangs on with the team, could also be valuable late. And then you also have a very, you know, under-owned Houston team on the other side as well for that week 17 correlation where Houston will play Jacksonville. So that's one that I think could be sneaky as well. And that's where I think it's important to remember that just being agnostic about which teams you're taking for that week 17 correlation and just, you know, trying to find the merits of them. Jacksonville I think is when you can find the merits pretty easily if you really start to look for it. 
I, I love the week 17 Jacksonville Houston call because I think there's some pieces there that that could potentially get you there. But yeah, that that could explode. Listen, I, I'm a Davis Mills truther. I, I'm a believer in Davis Mills, frankly. And Brandon Cooks, we talked about it on a, on a different podcast. I'm trying to remember who the guest was, but uh, you know he's the Rodney Dangerfield of of wide receivers. He just gets no respect whatsoever, and he just keeps churning out real a thousand yard seasons every single season uh, at least for the last six or seven so um I, I like that quite a bit and there's a lot of wide receiver twos there that you can speculate on uh with houston so i think that's super clever so let's talk about some late round sleepers or breakouts uh anybody that's sort of coming to mind in terms of well not coming to mind but maybe you know you've probably done some best ball drafts guys that you you continue to land on that are just there late I mean, so one guy and a lot of the rookie running backs, I think have a lot of appeal to me in the late rounds because I am largely drafting zero RB teams and people that aren't familiar with zero RB team doesn't mean you're literally drafting zero running backs. It means that you're not wasting that capital early on on running backs and you're hoping to really pinpoint wide receivers early on. So for me, I'm always taking or at least trying to take an elite tight end within the first five rounds. That is one uh, one structure that's had a lot of positive win rate data over the last seven years across best ball, not just underdog, not just drafting, but across the entire industry of best ball data. I um, mean, that's something to me where you know if you are taking those guys early on you just want flyers at running backs who can bubble up and part of the advantage of drafting right now too is that it's very likely that somebody a somebody's gonna get hurt that's the unfortunate side of football with training camp coming up next month but also there could be a rookie running back who comes out of nowhere like josh jacobs had some negative reports on him samir white is a guy that they invested decent capital with mm -hmm. on the raiders as well and maybe kenyon drake doesn't heal up enough and samir white actually ends up being a bell cow back by the time week 17 rolls around so to me guys like samir white hassan haskins uh keontae ingram from arizona loses some luster with their well oh, throughout williams in that team now for arizona but still keontae ingram could theoretically be a bell cow back if james connor went down if you're drafting late i think especially you're trying to draft some of these guys that are leverage plays against much higher drafted picks where if james connor fails he's probably killing a lot of teams and if you somehow end up benefiting off of that that's the pure dfs play where the other teams are coming down as you're coming up and then for best ball i, I just think that's not part of the thought process enough for a lot of the field that's interesting so I, i'm curious when you go zero rb when are you typically drafting that first running back it can depend, you know, I can do sort of a hybrid zero RB where I'll take a, a you know, a Travis Etienne in particular, when he's going in the fifth round, I think was pretty appealing. Brees Hall, also a guy going in the fifth round who has some appeal profiles really well compared to a Jonathan Taylor. But I think for the most part for me, I'm normally not taking, or if I can avoid it. And obviously, you know, if the rooms line up where there's only running backs on top of the board and their ADPs are appealing, you got to take one. Cause that's just the smart move for your team construction. But if I can avoid that and mostly spam wide receivers for the first few rounds and get my elite tight end within the first five rounds, I might not take a running back until round eight, and then I'll try to get six or seven of running backs in the mix because running backs fundamentally are just lottery tickets. Like, and it's a bummer to say that, but you kind of see it with how the NFL shifted as well, where wide receivers are getting the big paydays, running backs are not. And then you probably, yeah. you might have actually seen like the last big running back contracts go to guys like McCaffrey and Ezekiel Elliott over the last few years. So I think I have a lot of comfort in taking receivers and just letting you know running backs be that dice roll. Um, but I think ultimately that's the approach is that you start taking your running backs at round eight, and if you really load up your teams with receivers tight ends the qb that you like the most in that first seven rounds all the running backs could be found money by the time the season comes actually to fruition that that sounds like it feels like to me that the zero rb approach is almost like best suited for best ball because because mm -hmm. i mean I, I love that because what you what you can do is sort of play i mean i guess you, you can so, sort of sacrifice your record on the front end but you're right a lot of these rookies or, or second year guys that nobody's really focused on because of injuries or just because they're flat out better they end up you know they're, they're the guy in week four or week five and maybe sometimes the rest of the season um i wanted to ask you about a few running backs you mentioned Brees hall but there's two others i wanted to ask you about but i before i ask you I, I will submit to you, and I'm so glad you brought up the last big contract thing when it comes to Zeke and Christian McCaffrey. There is not, I want to get your comments here. There is not a more unfair position in all of sports, not just football, as the running back position in the NFL. Because not only, so first of all, we, the, the secret's out, right? You don't need to draft a, a running back high. The Adrian Peterson days, like the, those days are like long gone. So you're getting really talented running backs at the top of the second round, maybe late first round, like CEH went uh, with Kansas City or, you know, top of the second, third, fourth, fifth round. So these guys are in, you know, four or five year deals and 
then they're kind of like at that point after running the ball for four years, a lot of times they're sort of washed up or they're damaged goods because they did sustain an injury over those four years. And the problem is even if they were good, they are not getting the big con like their first big contract. They just get their rookie deal. And then their next contract is something that's like, you know, sort of pennies compared to the receiver because they know teams know how replaceable they are. So they're taking all the wear and tear. They're taking the bad contract on the front end and they don't even get the benefit of a good contract on the back end because of how replaceable they are. Oh yeah. I mean, to me, that's a full preach for you. See, I think you're dead on here. You're the running back advocate that they need because it is really unfair that these guys take the brunt of the damage and then they don't get paid or they end up in a Todd Gurley situation where he got paid and then basically saw one year of that money. And then the Rams are like, Nope, I think your knees have had enough. And then he goes to the Falcons and gets a lesser deal. And now will Todd Gurley have a job in the NFL again? I think probably not. Um, and that's a sad thing I would say, but ultimately, you know, you have to let that inform your process as a drafter where we're yeah. seeing the wide receivers get the biggest contracts ever. Cooper cups, setting records, all these guys all off season have set new records and then get topped by the next guy running backs are the exact opposite way where you just see them hedging against the guys more than anything. And I think that's something that you have to inform your drafting with where if teams aren't willing to spend the capital, you probably shouldn't either. And I think that could be something that does pay off if you're a bit ahead of the curve and how you see that. So I want to ask you about a couple of rookie running backs. There's obviously a lot, you know, just down the line, like like Tyron Davis price comes to mind a little bit just because of how San Francisco seems to rotate their running backs, whether it's Kyle Shanahan or Mike Shanahan, frankly, but uh, James Cook and, and Kenneth Walker um, so are interesting to me because they're big names. So they're not secrets to anybody uh, when it comes to Cook Walker. I mean, obviously, Brees Hall is the class of the field here. But are you speculating on either of those other two running backs? And if not, are there other running backs that you're speculating on late in your drafts? So Walker, to me, A, the rebrand of Ken Walker, brilliant. Sounds like a powerful name. Sounds like an 80s running back. You could have trusted for 30 yes. touches back in the day before yes. he had a concussion at 24. <laughs> Never <laughs> saw the field again. But I like Ken Walker a lot. You pull up his player profiler, you know, profile where they break down some of the college dominator numbers and show you know, historical comparisons for guys statistically to say like, oh, here's what he looks like. It's not just a game tape thing. They say he compares to LaDainian Tomlinson. And that shows you too how this mm. has gone where you know Ken Walker is not getting drafted like LaDainian Tomlinson was, but he might have the same upside in that Seattle offense. And I I don't mean to always stand for Seattle, but Walker, I think he and Brees Hall are a cut above everybody else. Isaiah Spiller, to me, also grades out of somebody could be interesting just because Austin Eckler, we know, gets a ton of work in the pass game. Spiller, not quite a pass game back, a little bit bigger body, but there's a pathway for him if Eckler is healthy. He just takes some touches away because Eckler has been fragile in the past. But also, you know, a rookie running back who can get more of that role, you're kind of getting both sides of that, where maybe he just gets gold line touch to start, but then maybe Austin Eckler does get hurt and you kind of have him, you know, be beneficial down the road. I think that's something to keep in mind is just trying to always take the lower ADP back. Um, James Cook, who you mentioned as well, see, so yeah, like I think is a pretty guy, interesting guy to talk about as well, where he was going ahead of Devin Singletary in some drafts or for a while there ADP mm. wise. I don't know that it was justified. Like I like James Cook, but a lot of the times people just like that shiny new toy. So yeah. really it just comes down to, you know, take Devin Singletary if he's a lower ADP guy. But if that flips and we see Singletary starts to bubble up, then you probably should take James Cook in the hopes that Singletary just, you know, doesn't hold up or, you know, the draft capital they what invested in Cook is what they decide to focus on more for the Bills. That's sort of the, the game theory there where you can have it both ways in best ball, especially if you are drafting a lot of teams. And the, the final best ball question for you, and then I want to touch on something that happened today in the NFL. Uh, any avoids? Are there just any teams that you're avoiding because maybe they're just too popular or their week 17 is, is garbage as, as far as you can see it now, or you just don't like them, period? Are, are any teams that if I'm, a, if I'm new at best ball, I probably want to shy away from these teams or guys? I wouldn't say teams as much as players I would avoid. Like, I don't think I have a single share of Derrick Henry. I know that might be controversial if you are a season-long player and you just remember all the positive things, but there's enough data about guys who've had uh, the workloads that he's had over the last few years. We saw him break down on the stretch last year. He's an older player who's had over 370 touches in a season, and that tends to be a pretty bad arbiter of what's to come, according to some of our Football Outsiders research. So... He's one guy I'm avoiding, but that doesn't mean I'm avoiding Tennessee. It means, if anything, I like Hassan Haskins more. I like that Tennessee stack with Traylon Burks more. Um, I think there are some ways to sort of justify the other side of the equation than if you feel strongly about a player. Uh, but team-wise, besides that, I think it's really the Packers, like ambiguous situations right now where – there isn't a big lever to pull in the hopes that you're going to get it right. Like the advantage in drafting right now is that you're ahead of a lot of news curves, things that people won't know in July and August. You're drafting now in the hopes that you can get that right. But the Packers, like maybe Amari Rogers and Romeo Dubs pay off in the 18th round, and they're just basically super cheap flyers that end up being the best parts of that Packers stack. But maybe you are right to pay the premium on Alan Lazard. 
I don't think I have enough read on that. And I think so. I'm, sometimes the ambiguity of these situations could be the death of, a, of your lineup overall because these things could change so wildly over the next two months. So it's so interesting um, what you just said about, hey, if you think you have a read on something in June or July, like this is a great time to get in, into a best ball draft because I can tell you, I, I'm in sort of like three big, what I consider to be big redraft leagues. And we're always trying to decide a draft date, you know, year to year. And I'm always trying to do it as soon as possible. In other words, as early as possible, I should say. And because I feel like, A, because it's fun to do drafts and I, I want to like spread myself thin in that regard. But but two, because I personally think I have a lot more information than other people. And I want to be able to spring on a guy that everybody's considering an RB3, but really he's like an RB like 1B or something. And as it, you know, whatever the case may be, what, whatever position you're talking about. But I think that is really the the huge advantage to best ball. If you think like, listen, maybe I don't like, I think I know everything. I clearly don't, or I'd win every single year, but most people just like poker, right? They're really confident in their poker skills. They're really confident in their GM skills when it comes to football. If that is the case, you should be doing best ball because you can take advantage of, of your alleged acumen in June and July, as opposed to waiting till August and December, where everybody tends to have the same amount of information. Yeah, you can still speculate, but unfortunately, the, the information stream, it's out there for everybody at that point. So a lot of people are more on a level playing field. So I, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong. That seems to me, I, I think best ball is fun in its own right, but I think that sort of built in advantage that a lot of people think they have when it comes to the information they have post NFL draft, that it's the perfect time to showcase those skills in best ball, correct? Yeah, I would say pre-NFL draft is tough, and that's, I think, part of why underdog doesn't do their best ball mania until after the draft, where at least you know where guys are going to land. But there are rookie and sophomore drafts you could do where if you just believe in the talent of a player and you hope they land in the right spot, that could be mm -hmm. good. But I think, you know, the news item we're going to talk about in a little bit on this show is the Rob Gronkowski one, where if you were drafting Cameron Brait over the last month and a half, you probably are going to be in a really good spot because Cameron Brait's going to soar up the boards. There's no OJ Howard in Tampa Bay anymore, no Gronk mm -hmm. theoretically in Tampa Bay now. And he's been going at you know, either being undrafted entirely or going in the 18th round or you know 20th round the leagues that have that so that's something that you know is going to get more valuable i took the other take where i've drafted a good amount of gronk not a crazy amount or anything because there was some risk profile but i thought he was going to come back i thought tom brady was going to talk him in and giving him one more run um, gronk certainly has shown their propensity for following tom's lead and that's not the case but that's the volatility there where if you get that right on the bright side you're probably feeling fantastic and if you're like me and you got a little more gronk you're like well you know that's unfortunately the way that it goes when you're pushing your chips towards the middle of the table but that's the risk reward profile of drafting right now well man you you mentioned it in theory you know he has retired because that's what he said and I, that, that's really what i wanted to ask you do you actually think he is retired or do you think perhaps he's waiting until the middle of the season you know the tampa schedule isn't super easy maybe they're maybe by week 10 they're you know six and four or maybe even five and five making a playoff push because they're likely to make the playoffs regardless and maybe that's when he decides to come back you get to skip training camp you, you have no wear on your tires through like basically two and a half months of the season and then you come back and then all of a sudden chris your best ball team is looking pretty good at that point what are your thoughts on the possibility that gronk actually might come back at some point I don't, you know, it's probably less than 50 50, but I think you're right that there is some chance that he just, you know, shows up and, you know, Tom calls in the favor. Maybe things are running bad. We saw at the end of the last season, you know, the Bucks' offensive line was not holding up and Gronk, a great pass catcher, but also a very good blocker, a tight end. So that could be something that he's just like, can you please help me out? Because I'm getting crushed. I'm 45 years old. I can't keep doing this, Gronk. So that's possible. You know, I think for me, I'm viewing the Gronk shares that I have now as a sunk cost just because I wouldn't draft him now. Like you could draft your Julios, you could draft your Wolf Fullers, guys that don't have, you know, spots at the NFL right now, but should mm. theoretically land on a roster by the time that training camp comes around. Uh, but I think that's something that, you know, there's some value there, but I think Gronk might be done and I think I'm safe, you know, saying on that side. And it is odd though. Like he got the big paydays from, from Fox. He got the, oh, sorry. I don't know if we can say, I don't know if we can say the F word on here. <laughs> we can say we got the big paydays from, <laughs> oh no, please do. Yeah, no problem. I <laughs> uh, got the funny. big paydays from one network, got the big payday from WWE. Then he came back and he's like, no, I want to play football again. And now he's got to start all over and get new deals. I, it seems odd, but that's sort of the beauty of Gronk, I suppose. Do you bump up? I mean, I think it's a natural maybe bump to a guy like Russell Gage, who, who I like. And I know he's not a tight end. Obviously, Cameron Braid is the natural bump there. But I liked Russell Gage as it is. And now everybody's talking about Russell Gage, it seems. Again, another another reason to do best ball in, you know, prior to June 21st, 2022, because I think people are starting to pay attention to Russell Gage. You probably should have paid attention when he had a three-year, $30 million deal and was specifically recruited by Tom Brady with Chris Godwin probably not being ready for the beginning of the season. With all that said, I would assume people are really going to start to dial into Russell Gage, what are your thoughts with him? 
Yeah, I think Russell Gage, we've already seen come up a little bit more where Mike Evans has already been going in the second round anyway. It's hard to imagine him getting into that first round in terms of draft capital for a best ball draft. But I do think Russell Gage, he's already come up. I think he was in the low 100s. Now he's closer to low 90s. Wouldn't mm-hmm. shock me to see him come to low 80s at this point. And I, I think that's a very solid call there where that is something where if you knew and you could follow the capital like C is talking about where you know he did get signed for a good amount of money and he had a pretty good run in Atlanta despite that team being absolutely awful. Yes. Um, he is a guy that could benefit just getting those targets over the middle. I would tend to think the entire passing offense, just everybody comes up a little bit because, you know, Gronk had the red zone targets. He had just a lot of target share overall for Tampa Bay. So that could be, you know, evenly distributed. But ultimately, if you are to play it on a pure football level, there's going to be more targets over the middle. Russell Gage is the guy who goes over the middle. So I think on paper, he should be the one who benefits the most besides Cam Braid, who's going to jump up a lot. I mean, side note to, to the Tampa faithful. I mean, Tim Tebow was a tight end in, uh, in uh, training camp last year. So uh, maybe he's available, but Chris, thank you so much. Uh, honestly, I thought that was a really good best ball primer. I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to, I, that we got some of your plays, but I'm also happy that you kind of educated some of the uneducated. And that includes me uh, when it comes to best ball. So that was great. L- let me ask you, where can we find you? We know we can find you at Chris Spags. We know you, we can find you at splash play pod. Great show that you do with Peter Overzet. Uh, and we know we can find you at football outsiders. Uh, what do you got coming up? Where can we find you? Uh, splash play is the thing that Pete and I do every Monday and Thursday. And then in the season, we go Monday, Thursday, Friday. I'm also doing some solo streams on our splash play YouTube channel. So if you're on this channel, I would say, check it out. And we have some fun there. But the main thing to me that I would say is you'll find me in best ball draft tables all summer long, because mm-hmm. a, I have this newborn who just, you know, we got to feed and we just have to sit around and wait for him. So I got to do something during that time period. Can't just be paying attention to him the whole time, but also like, it's just fun. Like it is so much fun to do. And ultimately, you know, like draft some of the cheaper entries out there, like get your feet wet, wrap your head around it. But ultimately, Ultimately, best ball to me is something that I say as somebody who's been in this industry now for, I see the same thing for you, you've been doing this for enough time, I'm sure. Like when you see an edge, you want people to take that edge and do the best they can to you know take advantage of it while they can. Best ball is going to get figured out in the next few years. Right now, it's not figured out. It's not the same thing as DFS where you know people, are, you know, the Osmo guys, Roto Grinders guys, all these people are always winning time and time again. Best ball, you can get in now and actually have a shot to win big. So do it. I think follow people who are smart, you know, hopefully check out Splash Play and we'll get some information from us, but just check out stuff around the space and guys like Sia being intellectually curious about it. Like that's the best you could do for this. Just trying to wrap your head around it and approach it in a smart way. I love it. Chris, thank you so much. That'll wrap it up for us today. We are continuing our off season series. Thank you to Chris Spags for joining us today and telling us about best ball. We will have another show for you next week and we'll see you then. See you later.